Okay, welcome to our first uh, paper two. Welcome to our paper two. This is our first revision paper two. Uh, we are doing it from question one up to question eight. This is uh, um, a theory paper. Paper two is a theory paper which comprises of eight marks from question one to question number eight. So question one to question number six, those are compulsory questions. And question number six is a graphical question. Question number seven and eight, those are essay questions where we shall answer uh, between each one of them. You have to choose one of them. So without so much ado, I want to welcome you. Kindly feel free to follow the social media that are showing down there and we shall be able to move together so we let us begin from the first question and the first question says below is a diagram of mammalian skin use it to answer the question that follows it's a mammalian skin use it to answer the question that follows so that is the mammalian skin that is the mammalian skin and uh, this mammalian skin we all know uh, it's a uh, skin of a mammal and uh, it has those parts r t q v and p those are the parts that we have and these are the parts we are going to use to answer the question that uh, is following us and the question that is following um, question number one says we name the parts labeled p q and r that is p q and r so part p is a hair follicle that's a hair follicle then part r q is those are sebaceous gland this part R, sebaceous glands, then part R is sweat gland, part R is sweat gland. So for more details, we're going to be seeing some of the question for function and ETC. So let's move on and look at um, the other question, question number two. Now question number two is uh, talking about uh, it's asking us to give the function of parts label Q and T. Part label Q and T. So part Q, I think we had already given the definition, the name of part Q, that is sebaceous gland. So sebaceous gland secretes sebum. Secretes sebum. And we know what is the function of sebum. Sebum it's a liquid kind of um, fluid that uh, is released and it um, actually makes the hair that is the hair of the skin to be more to be um, less permeable to water therefore it reduces uh, the permeability of those uh, hairs to water also T consists of actively dividing cells that produce new cells to replace cells lost or cells containing melanin that protect the skin against harmful ultraviolet rays from the sun. More function we are going to discuss next. So let us move to another question. That's question number C. They are asking us to briefly explain briefly explain uh, question number c they're asking us to briefly explain how the part label r contribute to the lowering um, to the lowering of body temperature on a hot day now um, the part they're asking us which is part label r you can see it here that is the part they're asking us that is the diagram so if we go back to the question again, they're asking us briefly explain how that part label R um, contribute the lowering of body 
temperature on a hot day so we had already given uh, the name of that part r therefore let's just go into the function that it secretes sweat we had said it's a sweat gland so it secretes sweat now sweat has um, water in it remember sweat contains some waste excess salts waste product but it has water in it so the water in the sweat evaporates carrying out carrying away latent heat of vaporization hence leaving a cooling effect so it's the water in the sweat that evaporates so that it carries away the latent heat of vaporization hence leaving a cooling effect another question give one function of the mammalian skin other than the more regulation give other function of the mammalian skin other than the more regulation so other than the more regulation the skin acts as a receptor for stimuli that is the receptor for heat the receptor for temperature the receptor for pressure uh, all of them are found on our skin so that in case of a touch you can be able to, to feel it in case of a uh, heat so all those uh, receptors are found on our skin number two it offers protection of internal organs and tissues uh, number three it also does the storage of fat storage of fat is done by the skin number four it also does excretion and number five it does the synthesis of vitamin d those are some of them but the question is also requiring only one so one of that is correct um, another question that's question number two that is from two students subjected an orange plant growing outside the laboratory to the following conditions one they selected two sized leaves and gently brushed them clean on both sides then placed the two strips of dry cobalt chloride paper on both sides of each leaf and opposite each other and cover the cobalt chloride paper with cellotape they observe the time taken for any color change to occur and recorded the following so we have the leaf then we have the upper epidermis lower epidermis then you have the time taken for color change remember the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis were first of all cleansed then after cleaning they were brushed after being brushed they were covered with a piece of cobalt chloride paper a dry one then they were it was attached with a cellotape both on the upper and on the lower so on the upper it took five minutes for the color of the cobalt chloride paper to change but on the lower it took only two minutes so let us look at some of the question now they're saying use the above information to answer the question that follows so the first question they're asking us what was the aim of the above experiment now for us to know the aim of the experiment we want to compare to look at the question what were they asking from what were they doing from the experiment we can be able to tell what they were looking for now here we are we are we have two sides we have the transpiration that is taking place but again we have two sides we have the upper and the lower and then we are looking at time the cobalt chloride paper changed on the upper and then on the lower so when it comes to the m it definitely means that they were comparing the transpiration of the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis so the aim of the experiment was to compare the rate of transpiration between the upper and the lower leaf surfaces now what was the purpose of brushing or brush cleaning the leaf why did they clean the leaf before uh, before attaching the cobalt chloride paper which was dry the reason is to remove dust particles from the surface of the leaf and any moisture because here we want to test the moisture content after a certain period so to make fair for both sides we must first of all uh, remove all the particles and all the moisture so that it we can have a clear answer what was the role of cellotape why did they add a cellotape 
and the reason why they had a zelter is to prevent moisture from the atmosphere uh, from reaching the cellulose for the cobalt chloride paper then what was the original color of the cobalt chloride paper cobalt chloride paper uh, in the lab we normally call it the anhydrous cobalt chloride paper the anhydrous it means it does not have any water so that that anhydrous is actually blue in color the anhydrous cobalt chloride paper is blue in color once it's exposed to water for example now here in the case where we are exposing it to transpiration and you know transpiration has water in it so the color that change the color that the students will observe after it has been exposed now to the rate of transpiration it will be pink now explain the difference in time taken for the color change it will be observed now we are looking at the upper and the lower so they want us to explain the difference this question is almost similar to the one for accounting accounting for the difference instead of saying explaining we can also use the accounting because here we are going to explain basing on the results so we, we shall first of all give a brief observation of the results then explain those results basing on the scientific skills that we have so we shall be doing what we call accounting basing on the results so because it's three marks first of all we shall start by explaining the table what have we seen like the first one you're saying the upper leaf surface took more time than the lower leaf surface that is what you are seeing the upper leaf surface took more time than the lower leaf surface then we proceed now by looking at the, the why with the reason was to why the upper took more time than the lower so we say the upper surface has fewer stomata than the lower surface so we are relating the number of stomata to the rate at which the transpiration was taking then we proceed by saying now therefore the lower rate of transpiration on the upper surface than on the lower surface and also remember the lower epidermis took less time because it has more stomata. hope you have understood there then number three red green color blindness is controlled by a sex linked gene the allele for normal is normal site is represented by letter capital c and of color blindness is represented by letter small c a carrier female is married to a color blind male now that is where the point is a carrier female is married to a color blind male first question what is sex linked genes Sex linked, sex linked genes are, only, are genes which are linked to those chromosomes or those genes that determine the sex. So genes that it is inherited together with those determining sex of the individual. For example, a good example is baldness in male. That is only found in male but not in female because it is inherited together with the Y chromosome then write down the genotypes of the parents so the parents the male remember we are talking about a male who is a color blind male so it will be represented by so there will be a letter c which is small so male is x small c y that means it's color blind female is x capital c small c x capital c x small c that means that female is a carrier then work out the F1 genotypes being given four marks in there. So this is how we want to work out. So this is uh, the working out. Where we have the parent. The parents are male and female. Those arrows are representing male and female. So we can use the arrows or you can use the name. You can write there male. You can write here male. And then write here female then you can also add those symbols or you can only simply use the symbols and then you forget about the the naming either can do or both or each one of them now the phenotypes we're talking about now the appearance and what we see this one is colorblind and this one is not colorblind so it's a carrier now the genotypes now the genes this one is x small cy 
and then this is x small capital C and x small c. So it remember it is the genes, the genotypes that we cross. So it's the genes that are going to cross. So we cross, we, that's why we use a cross here. Then now it's the gametes that will fuse together. So after crossing, these are the gametes. After crossing, these are the results that you get from the F1 generation. So question number one. What is the percentage of colorblind sun in all the male offspring? Now, we have the male offspring. We have two of them. We have the X capital C, Y, and the X small C, Y. So, which means the X small C, Y is the one which is colorblind, but X capital C, Y is a normal male. Getting it? X small C, Y is a capital, is a what? Is a colorblind then x capital c y is normal all of them are male so the, the question is what is the percentage of colorblind sons in all the male offspring so we'll take the number of the male offspring which is two then out of those two one of them is colorblind so we say a half of the total number of male is colorblind so a half of a hundred percent which is the two so that is fifty percent of the offspring now the photographs below are of organism resting on different environmental backgrounds observe them and answer the question that follows okay so these are the organisms and this i can see they are moth it's a moth i can see them so the first question name the aspect of evolution depicted in the photograph what kind of evolution is this this is what we call the industrial melanism industrial melanism and i'm going to explain down there explain the phenomena now this is where the explanation comes um we want to explain what happened actually for this phenomena took that is when you look at it uh, during this time that is during prior to the industrial revolution there was only one form of paper moth which was white but um it blended so well with the environment that was white but uh, as with the box and that is um after industrial revolution uh, the backs of trees were covered with soot because of the soot from the industry and the rest those back of trees were covered with soot and you know soot is black in color it's dark and therefore the white moth um were easily seen and detected by prey and therefore the prey were mainly birds and they were fed on while the black one the one which had melanin so we call them the black melanic form blended well with the soot covered backs of the trees in industry so they kind of survived uh, that kind of problem so how do we refer to the concept mentioned above this is what we call the survival of the fittest and i was saying they survived so the the black one which they blended so well with the black with the suit survived so survival of the fetus what we call adaptive radiation or natural selection state any four other evidences of the phenomena above in the modern world four evidences of such phenomena in the modern world number one is sickle cell traits in humans sickle cell traits in humans Number two is the resistance of drugs, pesticides, and antibiotics by pathogens. Resistance to drugs, pesticides, and antibiotics by pathogens. Then the diagram below represents the female reproductive system. This is the female reproductive system uh, with all those parts labeled. So they're asking us to name the parts label a b c and d so perhaps i can be able to display those parts there so that you can be able to see well um parts we're talking about so that those are the parts and you can be able to see clearly so they're asking us to do they're asking us to give 
to name the parts A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay. Now, uh, what are these parts? A, B, C, D, E, and F. So let us go back and uh, proceed uh, by naming those parts. So part A is the ovary. Part B is the oviduct, or what we call the fallopian tube. Part C is the uterus, or what we call the uterian wall. Part D is the cervix. So those are ovary, oviduct, or what we call the fallopian tube, the uterus, or uterine wall, then the cervix. So there are two functions of structure label A. Now, structure label A, from what we have seen here, structure label A is the ovary. So, what is the function of the ovary? What is the function of this ovary? So, let us go back and see. Um, ovary has two functions. Ovary has two functions. One is it produces over, produces over, two, produces the female hormones, we call them the oestrogen and progesterone. Then, how is part C adapted to its function? So first of all, what is this part C? Now, part C is the uterian wall, the one we are calling the uterus, the uterian wall, this one. Calling the uterus, the uterian wall. So how is this part adapted to its function how is that part adapted to its function so we go back and say it's highly vascularized when we say highly vascularized it means it has a lot of blood capillaries uh, to supply nutrients the fetus and drain away excretory waste in a wall line with what we call the endometrium for implantation of the fertilized egg or zygote muscular for peristalsis for expel to expel menses during menstruation and parturition, a great capacity to expand during gestation to accommodate developing fetus. Then they're asking us, of what significance is part E to the reproduction? Of what significance is part E? This part here, which you are calling it uh, the birth canal. Of what significance is this one to, uh, to, to the process? Of what significance is that to the process? So let us go back and see uh, what significance that is have. This part label, what significance does it have? And uh, here we are. One is for copulation. And two is the bath canal. Then question number C, which is a graphical question. A research was carried out to determine the trend of growth for some boys and girls. The average mass in kilogram was taken separately for a period of 20 years and tabulated as shown in the table below. So let us look at how children were growing, the boys and girls. That is what we have. Have the age, the average mass of the boys, and then the average mass of the girls. You can be able to see clearly. So they're saying on the same axis, draw a graph of average mass of girls, of boys and boys against age. So age one from the word against age, and um, age should be on the x axis. Then girls and boys average mass of girls and boys should be on the y axis so if you do your drawing you need to get something like that we'll have the age in years and then the average mass in kg you'll we'll have something like that remember it's a smooth uh, graph very smooth no turnings uh, no sharp turnings the one we are seeing there so awarding of max scale one mark each, so you'll get two marks. Axis, a half a mark each, you'll get a total of one mark. Plotting, one mark each, you'll get two marks. 
the curve will get a half mark each so that is um, one mark then labeling you get a half that is uh, each then that is totals to one mark then from the graph now from the graph determine the mass for boys at the age of 11 years the mass of the boys at the age of 11 years the mass of boys at the age of 11 years so we go back to the diagram look at the mass of age at 11 years so that is what we have those are, those are the diagram now i want us to proceed and have um graph yeah there we have the graph that is the graph so we are being asked to get the mass at boys at 11 years so we we'll come at this point here as 11 is between 10 and 12 that's somewhere here when we move up and we are looking for the let me go back again we are going we are starting from here and we are moving up 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 to somewhere here where we have the boys here then now we compare to this side we come up to somewhere here so we're talking about around 26 around plus or minus 0 0.5 that is 26 so go back to our question the answer is 26 kilogram that is plus or minus 0 0.5 growth rate in girls between ages 13 and 15 that is the growth rate now this is how we are going to calculate the growth rate first we shall get the girls at 15 it's 39 girls at 13 it was 33 then subtract girls at 39 minus 30, 39 minus 33 which will get 6 divided by 2 which is 3 so 3 gives us the rate that is 3 kilograms per year then number C account for the change in the mass of girls during the ages stated in 2 above account for the change in the mass of girls during the ages stated in 2 above that is between 33 and 39 there is an increase in mass because girls at adolescence grow faster number 2 that is, that is the explanation for that. In fact, it's very clear. There's an increase in mass because girls at adolescence grow faster. Explain the trend observed in the curves for both boys and girls. So I want us to explain that trend. Girls generally grow faster than boys. Boys grow slowly compared to girls, but later after puberty, they grow more steadily. Then a question, why do girls above 10 years require intake of food that is richer in iron than boys of the same age? And the answer is because the girls are undergoing menstruation cycle which has begun and hence they need more iron to replace blood loss during menstruation. Now mention two factors apart from the diet that affect the rate of growth in boys and girls. Mention two factors apart from that that affect the rate of growth in boys and girls. So I think some of these factors that affect the rate of growth in boys and girls. One of them is the genetic composition. If your parents are not mean, are not that tall, they're not that big, with, with big bodies, then definitely as a child you may also fall on the same track. You may not have those. Um, the related bodies that is if your parents are small stature then you may also have the small stature body number two is because of the sex of the child we have just said that, that girls at puberty tends to grow faster and even boys girls grow faster even very fast from even the beginning from when they're young so girls grow faster than boys number two state of the health if an individual, if a child is sick and maybe is not okay, that means the growth rate will also be affected. 
then emotional status if the emotional status of the children is not upright then the growth also may not be uh, steady may not be um, as fast as those ones who have stable emotion then apart from using average mass to estimate growth in human beings name two other parameters that can be used we can use the height of the body and we can also use the volume of the body the height and the volume now let us go to question number seven question number seven and eight they are optional so let us start with question number seven explain how the following plants are adapted to their habitats first one is xerophytes xerophytes these are plants which grow in dry areas so we call them the semi-arid and arid areas so we want to look at some of the factors that make them to live so well and adapt to live in those arid and semi-arid areas so number one some of them have leaves reduced in size and a good example is cactus you when you look at the cactus you see it has needle like leaves so those are some of the leaves which have been reduced in size to spine or reduces the surface area for water loss number two some xerophytes have photosynthetic stems that take the place of leaves to reduce the surface area for transplant so instead of having leaves other plants are um, resolved to be to having a stem which can be able to photosynthesize so that instead of having leaves that will at the end of the day lose a lot of water and remember we are living in a place where you have scarcity of water so they use those stems to photosynthesize number three some shed of their leaves we call them the deciduous plants they shed off the leaves during dry season to reduce surface area for transpiration number four some have thick wax cuticle which reduce cuticular transpiration their cuticles are thick and therefore the cuticular transpiration is reduced to the minimum level then some xenophytes have fleshy, succulent, juicy roots for storage of water. So they store water so that it can be used on later when the place is very dry. Remember this area is explained and prolonged dry season. So some have stunken stomata that accumulate moisture creating low diffusion gradient, thus reducing transpiration right so we're talking about having sunken stomata then most have reduced number of stomatas mostly on the lower leaf surface to reduce the rate of transpiration the stomata are also small in size to reduce loss of water by transpiration we're talking about the number reduced position also instead of having on the upper they have decided to put them on the lower surface but from that they have reduced the size of the stomata so that it reduces the rate of transpiration some show what we call the reversal rhythmic that is instead of opening during the day they open during the night so they open at stomata at night and close during the day to prevent the excessive loss of water by transpiration also some have what we call succulent stem which stores water a good example here is the cactus plant its stem is um, succulent and juicy so that it stores water uh, to be used in dry season then some have long tap roots that extend deep into the soil to absorb water far below so they have very long tap roots some of them some xerophytes have shallow roots that spread widely extensively in order to trap water from any little shower of rain so you discover that it has so many so in the case they say that anything a little shower of rain it will be able to get almost all the, the rain some xerophytes roll their leaves to reduce surface area exposed to um, thus reducing rate of water loss by transpiration some xerophytes have thorns on their stems 
branches, midribs, leaves to protect the plant from predators, browsers, herbivores, animals. Etc. Then also, some zerophytes have very short cycle, life cycle. Thus, they grow very fast to use the little rain within a very short period of time and produce seeds that can survive without the rain that is with the drought then halophytes halophytes is a plants which grow in salt areas so one they have roots that concentrate a lot of salts in water in their cells by active transport to enable them offset osmotic imbalance and taking water by osmosis some have salt glands that secrete excess salts some have water storage tissues to store water that has been taken in some like mangroves for example they have what we call the pneumatophores pneumatophores which have lent itself for gaseous exchange some mangroves for example have stilt roots for extra anchorage in mud flats most halophytes are found growing close to the water surface to enable them get what we call sufficient light for photosynthesis then those in deep water have high sensitive chloroplasts to photosynthesize under low light intensity now some eg the coconut have fruits with large erenchyma tissue to enable them float um, the last question which is question number eight a they're asking us to describe the inhalation the mechanism of inhalation inhalation talking about breathing in in man how do we breathe in no. so the process of breathing in occurs when the thoracic cavity increases in volume and therefore decreases pressure remember volume and pressure they are inversely proportional to a fixed volume in any fixed volume of air volume and pressure they are inversely proportional so when one increases the other one decreases so when the thoracic cavity increases when now we create more room for air to enter the volume will definitely decrease and if that occurs that is during the inspiration we expect the external intercostal muscles to contract and then the internal intercostal muscles to relax so when the external contract and the internal relax then we expect the rib cage and the rib cage will be pulled outwards and upwards outwards and upwards this movement pulls the ribs upwards and outwards then remember they have a diaphragm down there the diaphragm which is still uh, which is a dome shape will flatten by contraction of its muscle as the ribs move outwards and upwards they would it will flatten the it will flatten uh, the diaphragm then the flattening of the diaphragm together with the outward movement of the of the ribs increases the volume of the thoracic cavity and when the volume increases have said the pressure will decrease and when the pressure inside the thoracic cavity decreases then the atmospheric pressure outside will be higher than the pressure inside the thoracic cavity so this will force now the air to be pushed into the lungs through the nose and the trachea hence inflating the lungs hence inflating the lungs and number, the number b they are saying state three factors affecting breathing rate in human beings three factors so factor number one is exercise those who are exercising those who are running during vigorous activities breathing rate tends to increase and therefore because of the higher um, demand of oxygen and also the removal of, of co2 now faster breathing also eliminates the extra co2 produced by the increased respiration then we have age young people have higher demand for oxygen and therefore they breathe very fast for example in kids they breathe very fast because of their growing cells um, but elderly people tend to um, require less oxygen 
because of the less activity also then emotions the body emotions affect the production of hormone for example adrenaline adrenaline is a hormone which is known for fight and flight so adrenaline increases the general metabolism and hence increases the rate of breathing e.g fear anxiety and fright temperature when the temperature is high there's tendency in the rate of gaseous exchange to increase and therefore uh, if the temperature is too high also remember that the rebreathing rate will go down it will reduce then health um, during sickness the rate of breathing increases so the faster the rate of breathing enables the liver to remove toxins and drugs those released by diseases causing microorganisms then the faster rate of breathing also enables the kidney to excrete waste products of body meta metabolism through urine then you have the altitude at high altitude the rate of breathing is faster because there's less oxygen so that's why we breathe very fast but at lower altitudes the, uh, the rate of breathing is low because the oxygen is very sufficient um, number C describe how the brain regulates breathing breathing mo uh, movement normally takes place unconsciously nobody knows when he's breathing or not breathing so in the brain there's a region called the medulla oblongata which controls the breathing movement now this is how it does now as CO2 is blood reaches this region it triggers this part of the brain to send impulses to the rib muscles and the diaphragm which in turn responds appropriately that is if the uh, carbon dioxide is more then we expect the ribs to contract and relax very fast to expel it out so this makes breathing to continue on and on now during vigorous activity for example the concentration of co2 increases and into the blood tissue hence more co2 diffuses into the blood and reaches the medulla oblongata so the high concentration of co2 in the blood triggers the medulla oblongata to increase the rate of breathing so increase increase the rate of breathing helps to increase the amount of C oxygen in the blood thereby meeting the demand of the increased tissue respiration that is the end thank you very much and uh, feel free to join me once again for the next session thank you